Warning, some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. I have been on a lot of roller coasters, 500 to be exact. Now most of my favorite roller coasters are quite large. These rides tend to be very spread out and span across massive pieces of land. Rides like such are called out and back roller coasters. This means that the roller coaster will typically head in one direction before turning around and heading back to the station. Well every now and then, you find a unique roller coaster that does things differently. I have ridden twister coasters, where the layouts are quite twisted rather than featuring simple out and back layouts. However, I recently rode a ride located at Kima Boardwalk in Kima, Texas that takes the twister coaster concept even further. The ride is called Boardwalk Bullet and is easily one of the most compact roller coasters I've ever ridden. Boardwalk Bullet is a wooden roller coaster designed by the Gravity Group and built by Martin and Blumix. The ride opened in August of 2007 and has been thrilling riders ever since. Somehow, the 96 foot tall roller coaster with 3,236 feet of track is crammed into one acre of land. That is unheard of for a roller coaster of this size. And how is this possible? The ride is essentially built on top of itself. Here is an aerial shot of Wildcat at Hershey Park, a wooden roller coaster similar in height and length to Boardwalk Bullet. The ride stands 106 feet tall, so 10 feet taller than Boardwalk Bullet, and features 3,183 feet of track. And then here is an aerial shot of Boardwalk Bullet. Boardwalk Bullet takes up almost no space when compared to Wildcat. Cramming such a large ride into such a small plot of land makes for an interesting experience and this roller coaster will be one that I always remember. In this video, I will be giving my full review of Boardwalk Bullet at Kima Boardwalk. Boardwalk Bullet is built on the right side of Kima Boardwalk. The park itself is rather small, so the ride ends up dominating most of the skyline. The coaster sports a healthy amount of signage, with a massive Boardwalk Bullet sign facing the parking lot, and another sign themed to a water tower within the park. The ride isn't highly themed, but the theming used gets the job done. The ride is quite literally themed to a bullet and has a sort of western or Texas theme to it. At the time of recording, Boardwalk Bullet costs $6 per ride, and I believe an all-day wristband costs $25 which allows you to ride Boardwalk Bullet all you want. The queue line of the ride features long sloped ramps that are actually built directly into the main structure of the ride. This helps to make everything super compact. The queue line ends up running directly alongside the fastest section of the ride, which is right after the first drop. Because this section of the line is built directly into the structure, the queue line shakes majorly every time a train roars past. Now this earthquake effect takes place about every five minutes or so, even with two train operations. Operations at the ride were not the best. Although the crew would physically check all the restraints very quickly, the amount of time spent before checking harnesses was ridiculous. Although the park wasn't very crowded when we attended, so it wasn't a big deal, but I could see the line being miserably slow on a crowded day. The station of the ride is built within the coaster's footprint. With such little land to build on, where else would they put it? This creates quite the cool effect as you wait in line for the ride, as most of the coaster's layout wraps around the station several times. The layout even dives underneath the station at one point. Eventually, you climb into one of the two PTC trains. These trains are quite standard and feature your typical PTC lap bar and seatbelt. The ride is so compact that the transfer track is built directly into the station alongside the exit ramp with almost no cover. Now before we get into the ride experience itself, let's talk about some of the history of this ride, or the mishap really. In a rush to open the coaster, Martin and Vlamix did not excel with their attention to detail. The ride's track was laid down pretty terribly, which caused lots of issues. Here's an example of some of the janky track work. This is the ride's first drop, and rather than the track curving smoothly like it was designed to, it looks like something straight out of Roller Coaster Tycoon. Track work like such caused the PTC trains to not track properly around the layout, and caused the ride to run slower than designed. Much slower. And because the ride was running slower than designed, this caused other tracking issues which led to more speed loss resulting in an even slower ride. Take a look at the ride's animation, which shows the speed the ride was designed to run at, side by side with the actual speed the coaster ran at in 2007. You can see how much slower the ride ran in real life than it was intended to, especially later and later into the layout. Anti-rollbacks had to be placed on several of the ride's hills, which most likely were not considered troublesome areas during the design phase. In fact, Construction of the ride was so rushed that several of the ride's initial test runs were unsuccessful. Trains would valley, or stall at the top of the third hill due to the poor track work. During the testing phase, Martin and Vlamix had to revisit troubled areas of the coaster and adjust the track work so that bus speed would bleed off. 
After a few trial and error attempts, they got the coaster to fully cycle the track in mid-August of 2007. It's super important that wooden coaster trains properly traverse the track or additional speed loss will happen. Thus it is very important that the track gauge and overall track profile are built to design to allow trains to roll freely through the layout. It seems that Martin and Blamix have since learned their lesson and have gone on to build some very high quality wooden roller coasters. And over the years, it seems that track work on Boardwalk Bullet has greatly improved and so has the pacing of the ride. Although I still wouldn't say the ride runs as fast as it was designed to, but I'll discuss that later in the video. The ride begins with some of the only stray track found on the ride, besides the station, lift hill, and brake run. Most of the ride's track does not follow a continuous straight path because of how compact it is. The ride drops through a decently sized right hand pre-drop into the lift hill. The train then ascends 96 feet up to the top of the lift. When running two trains, the lift hill will begin at a slow jog, as the train on the brake run clears the block zone ahead. Once the block is clear, the train accelerates up the lift hill at a much more normal pace. Riders reach the top of the lift hill and get their only chance to gaze around the surrounding area. The train drops off the lift hill and wraps around a 270 degree left hand helix. This turn wraps back under the top of the lift hill and sends the train flying down the 92 foot tall first drop. The drop is only 56 degrees, but feels steeper than it actually is, especially when sitting in the back rows. The back rows actually offer a strong moment of projector airtime, which is extremely satisfying, making this quite the intense first drop. Now the first drop no longer features the kink that we see here in 2007, but it still manages to deliver extremely strong airtime. I'd compare this drop to the crazy ejector airtime drop on Raven at Holiday World. The train enters the drop with speed and delivers a surprising amount of airtime. The front cars don't really do too much, but it makes up for it in the next few elements. The train bottoms out of the first drop, diving into the structure of the ride as it banks into a tight right turn. The ride absolutely hugs the structure and surrounding track of the ride. The train whips right into a small airtime pop and then quickly banks to the left. This is like a wooden version of a Maverick s -Man. And let me tell you, this airtime pop absolutely delivers. I knew this section of the ride would be tight and compact, but man, this had to be the tightest and most compact section of a wooden coaster I've ever ridden. Not a lot of wooden coasters feature a low to the ground section like such, and Boardwalk Bullet does this during the fastest part of the ride, immediately after the first drop at 51 miles per hour. This makes this section extremely intense, and it's also the only rough part of the coaster, but only in the back cars. The back cars do jackhammer through the tight turn and small airtime pop, however, the front cars are rather smooth, so I'd stick to a non-wheel seat in the front if you want the smoothest ride. The ride shoots up to the left into another airtime pop as the train banks from left to right, and this airtime pop also delivers an extremely strong pop of airtime. I'd compare this to the spaghetti bowl on the voyage at Holiday World, but it is far more intense and compact especially since this entire section is built within the wooden structure of the ride. The train rockets around a large 180 degree highly banked turnaround. The ride exits the turnaround with a small double down giving riders a small pop of airtime. The train then climbs into the second tallest hill of the ride which is another turnaround. The front cars are given a great pop of airtime as the train ascends the first portion of the hill. The train turns to the left and then climbs up even higher into the second large drop of the ride. It feels like the train loses a lot of momentum here, but the hill is rather tall. However, the drop off the turnaround makes up for that loss of pacing. The front cars don't do too much on this drop, but riders in the back row basically experience a second first drop that also feels just like the crazy ejector airtime drop found in the middle of Raven at Holiday World. This drop absolutely delivers and sends riders in the back of the train absolutely flying out of their seats. The ride dives down under the lift hill and cuts left, hugging the ride's structure. The ride pops up into a small airtime hill delivering a solid pop of airtime. The train then banks left and wraps around the base of the large turnaround found earlier on the ride. The surrounding structure of the ride makes the pacing feel insane. The ride is built in layers, and each layer hugs the track and structure of another layer of the ride, which helps keep things very compact. The ride then rises up into a speed hill delivering a good pop of floater airtime. This hill actually flies right past the station and the train is banked to the left the entire time. It's quite the cool element. The train turns to the left a little bit and then enters another high speed floater airtime hill. It's not as intense as the hill beforehand but it gets the job done. Next, the train wraps around the structure of the 270 degree helix found earlier on the ride. The train banks highly to the left and climbs upwards through the structure. The ride then levels out of the turn into an airtime hill which then dives directly under the station of the ride. This airtime hill is a bit slower compared to the rest of the ride beforehand, and I think the train was designed to hit this hill a little faster. There's a decent pop of airtime in the back cars, but nothing too crazy. 
The train enters a right turn as it heads underneath the station and rockets out from underneath with a good airtime pop. This sends the train flying into a tight right hand turn as it hugs the ground. This turn also hugs the outside of the ride structure that houses the large 180 degree turnarounds found earlier on the ride. The train reverses directions and climbs up into a decently sized airtime hill. Now this is where the ride begins to lose its steam unfortunately. This hill doesn't offer too much airtime in the back cars but gives a little bit of floater in the front. The pacing isn't terrible, but I believe the ride was designed to take the hills much faster, as evident in the animations created by Gravity Group and No Limits. Trains climb upwards into an airtime hill which then dives down to the left into a left hand turn. This hill doesn't do much either, and actually features anti-rollbacks at the top as it is a slower element on the ride. I believe this hill was intended to be taken faster as well. It's still not a bad hill, but it's drastically tamer than the rest of the ride. It does deliver a small pop of airtime in the front cars though. The train rides through a left hand turn through the structure of the ride. This lap of the ride is actually in between the insane zigzag turn found earlier on the ride and the left turn of the third hill. The train coasts up a small airtime pop, which doesn't really give any airtime unfortunately, which then levels off and enters into a right hand turn that also feels like it should be taken faster. This turn also has anti rollbacks on it, which is kind of weird because it feels like it's supposed to be a fast turnaround. This turn wraps around the 270 degree helix found earlier on the ride and then pops up into the final break run, ending the ride. The last few hills of the ride are certainly taken slower than the rest, but this ride overall manages to still be an excellent wooden coaster, similar to Ravine Flyer 2 at Walden. The ride is super smooth for what it is, and I think Kima Boardwalk takes a lot of care of the ride. Lots of track on the ride looked new, and it certainly rode like a newer wooden roller coaster. I would hate to see this ride operate at a Cedar Fair Park, as I'm sure the ride would be unbearably rough. But the only rough section you have to worry about is the tight turn and zigzag immediately after the first drop. But only in the back cars. If you want the smoothest ride, stay in the front cars. It also amazes me that the two bench PTC trains were able to navigate the tight layout. The ride seems like it was designed to run Timberliner trains, which have a much tighter turning radius and cause less damage to wood coaster track. Now I think Boardwalk Bullet is truly a backseat coaster as it provides two great drops that provide a ridiculous amount of ejector airtime. Plus the pacing in the back cars feels much better than in the front. Now the front isn't too bad either, as I find the last few hills to be far better in the front cars than the back. Overall, this coaster is better than I was expecting and is one of the best coasters we rode during the Texas trip. The ride is a powerhouse packed with excellent pacing, highly banked turns, loads of airtime moments, head choppers, and a super compact layout that makes the ride feel extremely unique. Now I think one con of the coaster is that there aren't many lateral forces. The ride features very highly banked turns which don't provide any lateral forces as a result, similar to the Voyage at Holiday World which also doesn't really feature too many lateral forces. And the second major con would be how the pacing of the ride tapers off during the last few hills. But overall, this is a top notch coaster. I'd give the ride a 9.5 out of 10 as it does offer some truly unique and exhilarating moments. It's not the best wooden coaster I've ridden, but I would rank it above a lot of my favorite woodies, including Raven at Holiday World or Ravine Flyer 2 at Waldemere. While Boardwalk Bullet doesn't necessarily pack a punch through the entire ride, the punch it does pack through most of the ride is much better than what you'll find on other wooden coasters, plus the ride feels very long for its length and footprint, something I can't say about other similarly specced wooden coasters. Now Boardwalk Bullet is good, but it's not on the same level as other wooden coasters like Gold Striker, California's Great America, Ghost Rider, Knott's Berry Farm, or Boulder Dash at Lake Compounds, which I consider top tier, but I'd rank the ride at a tier just below those coasters. So overall, if you are a fan of wooden coasters or just like roller coasters in general, Boardwalk Bullet is a must ride attraction and something that you shouldn't skip when visiting the Houston area. If you're stuck between riding Boardwalk Bullet or going to Galveston Historic Pleasure Pier to ride Iron Shark, I'd say ride Boardwalk Bullet. It's far cheaper to ride as Iron Shark costs $16 for just one ride and Boardwalk Bullet is a far superior coaster. I hope you all enjoyed my review of Boardwalk Bullet at Kima Boardwalk. Be sure to leave your thoughts on the ride in the comment down below. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe and go ride Boardwalk Bullet.